everyone. Welcome back to Rolling Solo. My name is Adam Smith. We're going to continue our exciting adventure with the Stranger Things crew, now bolstered up with not only an additional character coming in with Will, but also another leader we've got added in. I'll talk more about him in a second. Plus, we had the Ballista here, which is added into our crew because we now have rumors of a dragon about. And in Green Horde, when a dragon is added, a Ballista is added as a potential combat weapon to take it down. Uh, we'll talk more about that when we actually, and if we actually run into the dragon, because again, it goes into the spawn deck and may or may not show during our playthrough. We'll see how it goes. You can see here I've got the quest book in front of me. Uh, the quest we focus on is quest number three. So first of all, I want to thank everybody that gave their suggestions as to what quest we we're going to play. Also, as to which miniature, the new miniature is going to be that's adding to our Stranger Things crew. So again, I'll talk about that in a second. First off, let's talk about the quest. So the quest is obviously set up here. You've probably seen some pictures of this on social media as well. I've got the uh, actual doors in place. I've also got some furniture in some of the uh, particular rooms. So there's certain uh, books that we basically have to go after and take out our text. So we got an objective section here. We also have a, a flavor text area. So I'll read that and we'll go down the list. So it says right here, first off, it's a medium six plus survivor adventure. It takes about 90 minutes. Although because I'm filming this, it'll probably double that uh, unless I can speed through it really fast but I'll be doing my best to cut out things that are unnecessary. Uh, we're gonna go into objectives now. So accomplish the objectives in this order to win the game. So the first one is to enter the necromancer's layers and find the blue and green objectives. Why is that important? Well, because there's a blue and there's a green door, and they're over here on these either on either side here, and there's a special token inside of each of these that is the second part of the objective down here that says to destroy these necromancers text, basically. Take the two objectives behind the blue and green doors, and that's the second part. But first, we have to find the blue and the green objectives first, and then we can crack into the doors and go further. Again, you have to do them in order. So you have to find the blue and the green before you start going into the rooms. So what we're gonna be doing is not only searching the objectives that are on the board, some of them are plainly obvious out in plain sight. There's one way up there, one over there, one here, one there. And uh, those are the four main ones, but we also have four that were actually created and put to the side. So again, when I put this all together off camera, essentially you take out the green and the blue uh, marker on the bottom side of two of these objectives is a green and a blue. You basically take those away, you put two regular red ones into the uh, main rooms here, blue and green, and then you take the other, uh, I think it's eight total, there's four on the board and four over here. Now that'll include the green and the blue, so you got six red, one green, one blue, and you shuffle them all up, and I have no idea where the green or the blue is, it could be either off the side of the board or in the board. That's the fun point, uh, uh, part of this particular scenario. I've never played one where I'm searching objectives that aren't on the board itself, so this is gonna be very interesting. Um, so first off, I'll talk a little bit about the special rules so you can help understand what's going on here. So this is kind of what I just explained. Take 10 objective tokens, including a blue and a green. Put two red objectives in the buildings, like I said, closed by the blue and green doors. Shuffle the rest face down, put four of them out on the, on the marked zones on the map, and then the other four dedicated face down piled next to the board, did it. Treasure chest. Each objective gives five experience points and put a random vault weapon to the survivor who takes it. So as of right now, I've put these piles of uh, cash and coins and everything else to remind me that whoever gets in there and grabs an objective not only gets five points, but it will also gain a vault card, which I've stacked right here. So we got a bunch of vault cards. These are including the Horde Box exclusives plus the base game from uh, Zombicide Green Horde all mixed together. Next up, it says right here, claiming what's ours. So it says a survivor who kills a necromancer gets an objective from the pile with the corresponding benefits. So again, another five experience points and random vault weapons. You can see the XP is gonna ramp up really quick. As we kill off necromancers, that's how we actually access this pile over here and start flipping them, hoping to find the green or the blue door um, objective markers. Lastly here, we've got a sealed door. So the blue and green door obviously uh, cannot be open until the objective has been taken. So at this particular point now, we've got everything set up. You can see it should match exactly the same. This map right here is essentially turned this way and you can see it right there. So we've got the green section mainly over here and over here. And in this setup, they're here and here. It's because I've just turned it uh, to go lengthways. It's a little bit easier. Plus we're right in front of where the survivors are gonna start into the mission. So 
Without further ado, I'm not going to go over any extra um, side information and side information being uh, about the actual dragon itself or the ballista until we start using them and then I'll talk about them. But I am going to talk to you now about a new character we added in and this character is going to represent Hopper. So someone had an amazing idea uh, in the comments in the last video to use this guy right here as Hopper and actually just looking at him I was like you know what it looks pretty close if he had a huge beard and he was wearing basically a whole set of Viking armor pretty much he would look like him so I'm like this works perfect so we've got Hopper here who is the cop from Stranger Things basically leading our crew in very thematic and we got all the kids with him um, and then on top of it we got the ballista so we got a whole bunch of armor going in we also have um, we also have other weapons or other siege weapons laying around that we can use just one currently remember once these things break down or if we happen to push them into a water hole, bad news. We don't want to push or move these things into a water hole or have them moved into a water hole. We lose them instantly and that's not good. So that's pretty much it. That's going to sum up the whole setup. There was quite a bit of changes there, but I thought I'd add a couple little touches to spice this one up. So without further ado, let's get into the first round of the playthrough. All right, so let's begin this adventure. The first person I want to use is Eleven, and that's because Eleven has a really cool ability allowing her to silently blow open a door without even having to roll a die to hope to see if she opens it. And we are close to one room right here which doesn't have an objective in it but would help us to jump in really quick, search and try to grab some gear maybe. It might be a worthwhile thing to do with our crew. We could also do that over here. So the debate really becomes, do we want to all just kind of run into here and kind of run down through here, grab the objective and see what we get, come out the other side. Um, the danger with that, of course, is we want to keep somebody on the ballista. Um, now, just so you guys know, uh, the ballista itself requires two actions to move it or fire it. So that's kind of where things get interesting. Um, it's, it's not going to be like the trebuchet where it was a full three, uh, but still it requires a decent amount of your turn in order to get it moving or firing it. And the other thing to learn about the ballista is that it literally shoots in a direct line hitting everything in its path uh, so that's pretty nasty too and it can even go through walls and all that kind of stuff so it's pretty insane um, it can be used to hit the dragon uh, if the dragon happens to show up but it can also be used for other attacks against regular uh, you know units from long range of course targeting priority order still applies but we'll talk more about that once we actually use it rather than talking about it now so what I'm going to do is I'm going to probably have 11 go crack the door, but maybe instead of going for the single door, I'll go over here. And we'll see. Now, the only danger with this is we're spawning one, two, three, four, five, but it's like, why not? Because we really want to, uh, in my mind, mainly because we want to try to unlock these in the blue level and not have abominations show up in these rooms. Um, that's kind of my line of thinking. So what we're going to do is we're going to go ahead and have uh, 11 here take one action to go into here. Uh, her second action is going to be used to her telekinetic, uh, telekinetic blast. I almost said telekinetic. I don't even know what I was talking about there. Uh, her blast, and of course, it's going to... Oh, actually, this one does make noise. Ooh, I was wrong. So it does make noise. Um, I knew that from last game. I don't know why I said it didn't make noise. So yeah, she makes a lot of noise by blasting that door open. So we'll grab a noise token, but it's a successful thing. It just happens immediately. So she makes a noise token, and just so you guys know, I'll be trying to use noise tokens a lot more often in this playthrough because it's going to matter. There's a lot more corridors and different ways for monsters to get to us, or zombies I should say. So one move into here, second is going to be used to, to use the blast to oh, blow open the door. So it's right here, spend an action to open a door within range and line of sight. So within range right now. So she's going to crack this door wide open, blasting it open with her spell which is great we got access to one potential chance to get a green or blue objective in here and now we're going to go ahead and we're going to spawn for each of these and all i'm going to do is to grab the cards and lay them in here and we'll go from there so what we're going to do is i'm going to grab this tray bring it a little closer and start pulling these one at a time so the very first one is assemble the horde so it's going to be two walkers and i am doing this from the beginning all the way through so that's one. Oh, that's not good. Uh, another assemble the horde. This is going to be a fatty that's going to be joining this party. Okay, so we can handle all those so far. Uh, here we've got three orc runners in the main objective room. That's kind of nasty. Uh, going even further along, we've got uh, one orc fatty way down here. This would have been a great time to get a bunch of abomination ones because then it could have thinned the herd, but uh, it doesn't look like that's happening. 
and then an assemble the horde one orc fatty up there. Just like that, we've got our miniatures in place. You can see it's a little bit more active going on in that building now. Even it's kind of funny, the objective is actually in the room with the most uh, zombies, which is kind of ironic. We also have a whole bunch of fatties covering all the doors and the corners. Like it's, it's laid out quite well for them. So what we're gonna have to do now is continue on with Eleven's action. So again, I was one to come here, one to blast open the door. I have one left. So I could make an attack from this zone into this zone with a, the uh, blast again because I can go range one. So I can roll a single die hoping for a four and I can potentially hopefully knock a walker off. So let's give that a shot. That's pretty much as good as she can do right now. So here we go with the roll. That is not gonna do it. So that was a miss and uh, that is a little, that's too bad. So that really is 11's full turn. The other thing we don't want to forget about is a noise token because that was a second attack coming from a spell because anytime a spell or attack is cast, regardless of how many hits are actually made, you still produce noise per action. So that would be two noise tokens as I tried to crack the door and also tried to kill a zombie. Successful in the door, not so much on hitting the, uh, the zombie. So now we're going to move on to the next active character from our group. I think it would be a good time to become a little bit more familiar with our character Hopper here and the abilities Hopper has as he's new. So he's got the Brother in Arms plus one die combat ability. These are two separate skills that are merged together. So first off, let's talk a little bit about the plus one die to combat. So basically in the rule book here under the skills section, it says a survivor's weapons and combat spells roll an extra die in combat. So whether it's melee, ranged or magic, Dual weapons and spells each gain a die for a total of plus two dice per dual combat action. So if you get your duel on him, very, very good. So if he can hold, uh, you know, two short, short swords, he gains that plus one on his roll on both of those swords, which is crazy. Uh, the other thing is he also has his brother's uh, brother in arms uh, ability along with it, and that's considered a game effect. And it says the survivor can use this skill whenever standing on the same zone as at least one other survivor, as long as Brother in Arms is active, which mine is. Each, uh, uh, let me see here, each survivor in the zone, sorry, including the one with his skill, uh, benefits from the indicated skill or game effect. So as of right now, in the last turn when Z left the square to do her own thing and zap, wouldn't get any benefit, not in the same zone as uh, Hopper. So anyone that's currently in this zone could benefit from that ability right now. And I'm thinking it might be a good idea to have Lucas do some shots with his arrows and clear out these walkers quickly. So we can have the guys that have the heavier swords get inside and go after the fatty. Cause remember we need a two damage weapon for him. So let's go ahead and see how that pans out. All right, so we're gonna go ahead and activate uh, Lucas here. So Lucas has a bow, the spiked bow, and he gets one die when he's rolling it. So it's the one on the very bottom. Bottom there his range is zero to one if he wants to use it as an up close melee weapon he can use the top section as well we want to use it for range it gives us one range away but then his actual blue ability he gets from the start gives him plus one giving him a total of two range so from where he's standing he can go one and he can always go through a door but only one space deep uh, wouldn't be able to hit this regardless because of the corner but even still the rule state can only go inside um, of, a, of a building one deep in, that's it. So this is perfect for him. He can shoot into the doorway and that's fine. Uh, so he's gonna take a shot. He's gonna use uh, Hopper's uh, benefit of brothers in arms to give himself an extra die when he rolls. So he's now rolling two dice on his attack. Could potentially kill them in one go. So we need, based on his spike bow, a four plus. We're hoping for that result. And we got, ooh, one miss and one success. Polar opposites of each other, but we did get a kill. So we're gonna take this walker, throw it away. We're also gonna make sure Lucas gets his XP. So we're gonna bump him up to one. There we go. And technically I could try to do that again. I think I might just because the odds are really good with Lucas. So I'm gonna go ahead and have Lucas. And I'm thinking at the end of the day, having Lucas potentially sitting in the street might be the wisest decision based on his long range shooting. He becomes a lot more useless when he gets inside of buildings because of the limitation on how far into a building he can shoot. So keeping him on the street, maybe with Hopper, as they roll up with the uh, ballista, might be the best idea. And we'll send the rest of the crew uh, into the building to see how they how they fare. But we're gonna do a little pot shot here with Lucas, see if we can land it. Nailed it, so it, was pr it perfectly worked out. So we killed off that walker as well. And uh, Lucas is gonna go up to two XP now. He does still have one other action to take right now. So the question is, what does he do? Does he position himself somewhere else? 
I think it makes sense based on the fact that we will have a spawn way up there at some point, maybe to get Lucas a little further along. So I'm gonna put him here. I mean, I'm tempted to put him here and maybe crack this door because that's another way that they could gather some uh, some supplies. Oh, maybe I should do that instead. Now he can't open it this turn and he actually has a spiked bow so he can't actually open it at all. But I could have Hopper run over and, and do that. So maybe that's what I'll do. I'm gonna put him over here. I don't know if this is gonna work out. This is just my strategy. I'm gonna move him over there and that's gonna be the end for uh, Lucas. And what we're gonna do now is we're gonna have Hopper uh, go next. We don't have to worry about runners. Runners are the biggest concern in this game because of how quickly they can move. Everyone else in this building is moving fairly s slow, so we should be okay until the runners get out, then things get interesting. Uh, I'm gonna have Hopper in, uh, go next, so Hopper is gonna take one step into this area. Uh, just so you know, again, the bow is silent, so no noise whatsoever for Lucas. Um, Hopper now is in this location. Hopper has a door opening short sword, but has to roll to try to do it. So we're going to try to make a, an attempt on the door, and hopefully we don't make too much noise while we're banging on it. Uh, we got it. Nice. So we did make some noise regardless, of course, for breaking, in, breaking it open. But uh, just like that, we've cracked the door open on the first success, and he does have one more attack after this, so that's good. Uh, but he is, uh, he's uh, melee, so he's not gonna be able to do much inside. Here's hoping this is not nasty, so we're gonna go ahead and pull this right now and find out what it is. Uh, we pulled, oh my goodness, that would have been pretty bad. So we just got rid of this out of the pile. Now remember if I, um, remember how I actually set these decks up for spawning, I believe there's two of every abomination in the deck. So this gives, uh, now we've eliminated uh, one of the two chances that this crazy looking thing will ever show up again. And if it did, that would be terrible. But that is not going to happen. So there's nothing in that room, which is fantastic. It's completely empty. So at this particular point, uh, Hopper could basically just move in. I don't see why he wouldn't. So he's going to jump into the room and he's going to be ready to search that in the coming round. So that's pretty much his turn. Now we've got three more guys left in the middle. So we want to get into this room but we want to be smart about it. So we have, um, let me see, we have Dustin here, and Dustin, the uh, north of the halfling, has the only weapon that can do two damage, which is the only weapon that can technically kill a fatty. So we want him to come in either, well, we want him to come in, hmm, this is dangerous. So Dustin is here, if he goes one, two, and three, he's in the same room, but he's not making an attack this turn. So it'd be better to put Dustin maybe here, and, uh, but I mean, there could be an extra activation that could, could could hurt him, but I think putting him here is the best. And I could maybe search, that's not a bad idea. So I could go one, two, and then use up that last action to search. So let's do that and hope that we find something decent. Dustin, you have found, oh no, this is what I wanted to have on Lucas, plenty of arrows. So this is gonna be something I'd like to give back to Lucas. We had that on Lucas in the last one, it was really useful. Um, so basically that's just sitting up in his backpack right now. Uh, okay, so that was that. That's uh, his turn resolved. Uh, next up, we're going to have... Oof, what do we want to do here? Will, Will, what do you do? So there's an ability here for uh, Will, which we haven't talked about because he's a new character added in for this particular playthrough. He has what's called Zombie Link. Uh, so what we're going to do is we're going to talk a little bit about that because I actually did cover that, I think, in the previous uh, playthrough at the very end. But let's just refresh our uh, our minds on what that ability does. Oh yes, do I ever remember what this skill does now. So this was the one that I described to you guys in the last playthrough called Zombie Link. And what this does is every single time one of those extra activation cards is pulled, and it has to actually say extra activation, it's almost like Will has a linkage to how the zombies activate. And when they activate, he activates. So it's not on their regular zombie turn, it's on an extra activation. And that's also not considered uh, an extra activation when, uh, if, I'm not, I'm, if I'm not mistaken, it's not when we run into miniatures. It's only when a card, a spawn card, truly comes up as an extra activation. So that can come in really handy because most times the zombies move, and none of the heroes get to move, but Will's gonna be able to, which could potentially put him into a good situation or get him out of a nasty one. So anyway, we're not gonna be able to use that right now. So Will can probably just activate and maybe head into the building. So he's gonna go one, two, and he'll do the exact same thing along with Dustin. He's gonna go ahead and search. Please be a good weapon. Hey, look at that. So Will is our hero at the moment running around with chain mail armor. This can be used across any of the four different difficulty levels or levels of XP. And it gives him a uh, four plus on his rolls when he gets attacked. That is awesome. So I'm gonna go ahead right now and you can see this is the body slot. He can also technically carry a, a curved dagger here, but he doesn't have one. 
he'll put the chainmail armor on and look at that it even matches what he's currently got on basically so that worked out really well he's a little bit more protected that's good because he can't actually fight these bigger guys so we're going to have dustin do that and uh, his turn is done so we'll move over to will now we're going to probably go ahead and have the ballista left here we're probably not going to do anything with it just yet we might roll it forward later but for now we're really just getting ready getting stocked up and, uh, and, and trying to clear out one of the buildings as we go along. So I wanna have, uh, and I, keep, I just probably just said his name is Will, I meant Mike. This is Mike, he's gonna go one, he's gonna go two, and now he's in as well, and he's also gonna search. So here's hoping that this ends up being good for him. Oh my goodness, we really need to find some bows. We've got a ton of these, plenty of arrows. This card's literally gonna sit and block everyone's view now too. <laughs> That's fantastic. So uh, what I'm going to do now is actually that is going to complete the full first round for the players. And now we're going to move on to the actual zombie turn. All right, so we're going to move our zombies into activation. And the obvious thing here, the fatty obviously sees these guys. So he's going to come into the room and join them. And there's actually three of them there, but that plenty of arrows is blocking things. And then the guys that are golden, are guarding, I should say, the gold and the objective are actually going to come towards us, which is three walkers. They're heading into the other room. We're going to have the fatty come down as well, because at this point, they're just moving towards noise. And technically, the most noise that's happening, this is a good time to talk about that, we have three noise in this area, because there's three characters, three noise in this area, two noise over here, and one here. But as you can see, regardless, there really is only one train for this uh, particular zombie pile to really follow, so there's no other option. If doors had to, you know, were open elsewhere, then you'd have to start scoping out which is the fastest route, and uh, if, it, if you don't have line of sight, then it's all based on, you know, what's the closest and all this good stuff. So we'll talk about more on that when we get into it as the ga gameplay goes on, but for now, quite simplistic. Um, so at this point, everyone's activated zombie-wise on the board. Now we're going to go into the spawns. So I'm just going to flip the spawn for each one, and then we'll fulfill all of the zombies uh, afterwards. So the first one we're going to do is on the far left. We'll go all the way up next to the one up top, and then right back down here. So here's hoping that these are not too nasty. First one up, we got ourselves another Assemble the Horde. And just so you guys are aware, this is what the Horde currently looks like. So it is already getting a little bit scary. We're going to have to get that trebuchet if we want to try to thin that. Uh, we've got an orc walker, so that's one plus one going into the horde. We'll have to do that off camera in a second. Next up, we got another assemble the horde. This is runners now, but at least they're really far away. So my plan about having Lucas eventually, you know, doing arrows down the middle, not a bad idea. Could work out. And then, oh, there we go. It's one of the necromancers. This is good. Now, it's bad normally, but remember, one of the objectives of the mission is if we kill Necromancers, we're able to go ahead and reveal one of the top objectives off the game board, which could potentially be the blue or the green one, which we need to get into one of those rooms. So, we got ourselves a wonderful uh, individual. Actually, if I'm not mistaken, this is the exact same guy, and uh, just so you guys are aware, I did go ahead and shuffle all this stuff, so um, but uh, this is the exact same Necromancer that showed up last time, so he's obviously a little angry uh, and wants some revenge, but uh, I do have his miniature handy, so I'll just go ahead and put him down. Again, when a, when a, a Necromancer comes into play, a spawn comes in with him, that's right, so it gets even worse. So there's going to be another spawn that's going to show up right here called the Necromancer, Necromancer Spawn. So we don't really need this card anymore, although what I'll do is I'll put it right here for reference because he's got a special ability. That ability says that uh, basically you have to be inside of the same zone as him to kill him. You can't shoot him from long distance. So he's going to be trying to go to out the nearest spawn. And the nearest spawn from where he just uh, basically came in at is going to be all the way over there. So that's kind of going to be his trajectory. He's heading that way. Now we also have to resolve a zombie spawn right now for that one that just came in. And what do we get? Enter the Horde? Are you serious? Well, guys, I guess we avoided it in the last game, but this time we didn't. And in the first round, we're already in trouble. So all zombie miniatures contained in the Horde spawn in the zone don't spawn more. Now, that's would have been a great card to get early in the round. If it had happened here, we would have just spawned these guys here. There would have been no other spawns happening throughout the rest of the round. That's the cool thing about this card. If you get it early... Yes, it's bad, but it actually stops spawning throughout the rest of the game board. If you get it on the last spawn, it's literally the worst thing that could possibly happen because you, well, you just already had a whole bunch of spawns. So, quick uh, quick little reinforcements here. So, this guy obviously was very angry the first time we took him out. And he's brought along a whole bunch of guys to help out uh, as he's kind of coming along through the streets at us. And, of course, oh my goodness. So, we got ourselves one, I think this one is a... 
Yes, that's right. There was no runners in this. This is a regular walker and another regular walker. So we got quite the uh, pile coming in there. This is not good. We might need to position this thing. Uh, and again, we have a water hole up here, so we can't push into water, if I remember correctly. Otherwise, we destroy it. So we're, we're kind of... We almost could position it here to have a shot at getting rid of the Necromancer, but that would be very risky. It'd be better to potentially fight our way through, come out the door here and meet them. That would make a lot more sense. Uh, if we get seriously lucky, who knows? Um, so at this point, we've now spawned for all the different spots. The only other thing to do is just to make sure all the noise tokens have been removed. So we're gonna quickly just grab all those noise tokens and remove them off the game board. Don't think there's anything else, nope. And we'll throw those over here like so perfect so that basically sums up the first round of this particular and uh, particular playthrough or the start of this playthrough and we're going to move into the second round right now all right well i think it's pretty obvious what i'm going to be doing here and that's going to be using uh dustin here to make an attack against the fatty he's the only one that can do it because of his norse sword one thing also i want to mention guys i totally missed this he has a free search action so in the last turn i could have from where i was gone one two done a free search action and then moved in here that would have been silly because there would have been a fatty there. Or I could have just ran straight into the fatty, tried to attack it. If I had failed, I would have got hit. So, I don't know. I did miss it. I didn't give him that extra action. But really, I probably wouldn't have used the extra action anyway. But I want to keep an eye on that. It's a free search action to use. Not an extra action, but a free search action. Which, in essence, kind of frees up one of your actions. So... We're going to try to hope right now that Dustin's actually been practicing enough to be able to hit the fatty on the first run. Here's hoping. So we're going to roll, and uh, without Hopper's help with Brothers in Arms, he's doing this all by himself. So that's not going to do it. So that's a miss. We're going to go again because we really need to kill this guy. Are you kidding me? I'm really good at rolling twos. Can I get something higher? Yes. Finally. Oh my goodness. Okay, so the fatty is dead. Uh, Dustin just barely, barely did his job. Uh, we're going to tick him up to 1 XP now. His turn is done. He burnt all of his turn, but he is in an area that's free of zombies now, and he has a free search action. So, you know what? At the end of the day, he can still search. So hopefully we can get something better. Look at that. Some chain mail armor. More armor. That's crazy. So we got another one here. Now I'm going to definitely put this on him. That's perfect. It's going to help him when he gets attacked, which will likely happen. And we're going to move on to the next guy. So this is where things get risky because if we run our guys into that pile of three, we got to make sure we can kill them all. I do have 11 here, so I can activate 11 next and do some long range shots. So I'll do that. I'm going to have 11 go one through the door. And actually, I'm going to take Dustin and put him near the back. So I remember that I've already activated him. And now we're going to shoot with 11, and we still have these three to use. So 11 is going to go now. Two actions to spend shooting them using the telekinetic blast. Uh, just so you guys know as well, sorry, the Norse sword uh, is actually silent, surprisingly. Actually, all swords are really, so there's no noise tokens to be put down. Uh, the blast, however, is going to be loud. So we're taking a shot here with this. Uh, 11 is going to blast away and hope for the best. We're going to try to kill as many as we can. Um, I do have a free enchantment action with her, but that's not really useful at the moment. Ugh, not good. So that's uh, one miss. So she's already moved one space, taken one, one shot and missed. Wow, not good on the rolling side of things. So now I'm really in trouble because the risk is I've got two guys going in there. And if they don't do well, then some of them could get hurt. And the downside is... Hmm, do I want to risk it? Do I want to risk it? Um, let's see here. This is, this is, I got, basically I'm rolling, I'm rolling 50-50 and I'd be going in with uh, four action. Oh, that's really rough. I don't even know if I could swing that. Um, this is, this is really tough to know whether that's a good idea to do or not. Um, hmm, what I might do instead is I might stay put and search. I'll search first, because maybe I'll get a better weapon that I can find. So let's go ahead with Will, and we're going to search with Will first to see if we get something that maybe can can do... Ah, there we go. Look at that. We got ourselves a longbow. Perfect. Okay, so Will now has a longbow, and it is a one-handed weapon. That's great. It shoots one to three. That's great. One die, and it's three range. Perfect. So for the next two actions, I'm going to do some shots from distance. So one die, we need three or higher. And uh, again, I can shoot easily one range inside of a building. So here we go with uh, Will, come on. Yes, that's one hit. So one walker removed, nice shot. Will's gonna jump up the track to two now. And then we're gonna go ahead and roll the next one. 
And what do we get? Two, that's a fail, okay. Now I'm actually confused. I don't think that Will's at two. I think he's only, I think that's his first kill. That might've been in the wrong position or it might've just been sitting weird because zero looks like it's really wide. I'm gonna put him at one. I don't believe he's killed yet. I'm pretty sure he hasn't. Um, okay, and then we're gonna go ahead and we're going to activate uh, Mike, I guess, is the only other person on this side. So let's go ahead with Mike. Mike is gonna search, so here's hoping. What did I get? Ooh, a healing. That's good. So we got some healing. I can use this with one hand. It's an enchantment. This would be something worth giving to Eleven because she can use them. Once per turn, the target survivor recovers a wound up to their starting total. Very cool. So I'll put this in his hand for now, but I'll likely try to trade that. Actually, I could trade that to her right now because she's in the same zone as me. Might actually make sense. Ooh, and then on top of that, I also got the Plenty of Arrows, which I could technically give to... Liam, that's something to think about. So what I'm gonna do is, I'm just gonna take a second to think about how I can maybe trade here. I'm technically on Mike's turn and we're going into his second action. We'll be right back. Okay, that works out pretty good. So what I'm gonna do is I'm actually gonna have Mike do two trade actions because he can do, uh, you can do multiple trade actions, but you can only ever trade uh, one with one survivor per action. So he's got two actions left. He's gonna use one of those actions to trade and it doesn't have to be an equal trade or anything. He can just literally give things. He's gonna give this down to Will. For, because Will now has a bow, so now he's got the ability to roll, um, you know, multiple times, or re I should say re-roll his misses, which is great. Um, and currently Mike doesn't need that. Uh, the other thing he's gained is healing, and if he wants to trade or give this away because it's an enchantment to Eleven, who's also in the same space, that's another action. So he does so, and now Eleven has the healing uh, enchantment, and that'll be his entire turn. But at least he was useful in terms of reorganizing the group. So we come over here to Lucas now. So Lucas and Hopper cracked this door. They really wanted to see what was inside, um, mainly because they wanted to search. So at this point, I'm definitely gonna search with Hopper and then we'll see where we should send him after that. So I got a sort, uh, a sort, a short sword, which is fantastic because, oh my gosh, that's amazing. It's a, oh, it's so good. Cause he's dual wielding now. This is perfect with his, uh, with his plus one die, he's rolling one die, two die, and then technically he gets to double that up. So that's really crazy. Now he's got a suit, he's very, very proud. So maybe that was worth it. Uh, so he's here and well, that was amazing. He's gonna go probably two back. He's, he's pretty happy with what he found. He's gonna head back and he's gonna come back into the fray and help out. Uh, Lucas on the other hand still needs something. So he's gonna move one into the building. He's gonna search now and he's found a lightning bolt. So he's got another ranged weapon that can, oh, roll two dice, and that's pretty good. That's not bad. It's a one-handed weapon, so we can drop that in just like that. That's not bad, and uh, he's happy with that. He moved in, searched, and now he's gonna move back out. That's pretty much it. I think that's all, unless, of course, I wanted to leave Lucas in there to potentially search one more time. Maybe I will. I'll leave him in there for one more turn. We'll do one more search with Lucas, and then we'll head out. Uh, I think I can milk him doing that one more time. Hopper needs to get back, and these guys need to focus on getting this objective. That's it. Those were all the survivors activated, so now we're going to activate the wonderful zombies. So first off, the regular walkers are going to come into the zone with us, which is no fun. The fatty's going to turn the corner. The other fatty's coming down to the objective. We're going to have a whole bunch... We're going to have, first off, the necromancer move closer to the... Uh, um, Oh, actually, you know what I just realized, guys, as I forgot to actually legitimately put these into play. <laughs> so I've been playing through this whole player turn, but I didn't actually put the orcs here. But that's okay. Nothing's messed up too badly here. We just got to put a walker here and one in the horde. I just forgot to actually fill them. So we're going to put two guys in like this. One of them goes into the horde. That card is now dealt with. And then we're going to do the one from up here, which is two orc runners and then one in the horde. And then that one's dealt with. I don't know how I missed that. Um... So we'll put two runners way up here. And we're gonna have to activate them right now because they would have been there. So technically just to resolve it, this guy, the only space he can actually move is here. And the runners are obviously coming towards um, Hopper in this case because they would have seen him. So, and they don't actually get stuck in any type of water when they move. So they run smoothly through the water. So they're on their way, they're on their way. So Lucas is gonna wanna get back uh, next turn. So anyway, sorry, coming back to this side, now we're gonna move the fatties all up one, along with the necromancer who's moving. The necromancer and the walkers, they're all walking in one giant group, so it'd be fantastic if we had like a, if we could get our hands on this, it would be really good. Uh, the other thing too is technically, yeah, that is gonna work. He's basically heading up there to that spawn. That's kind of his objective right now. 
we've got to stop them. We definitely have to stop them. And at this point now we got to spawn for four spawns. We got one there, we got one up there, two down here. And this time I'm actually gonna like do the spawning as normal. Oh no, another necromancer. Are you kidding me? Things are getting a little out of hand at the beginning here. So this one again is gonna bring a necromancer into play. That is bad. It also, as you can see right here, adds a walker, a fatty and a runner into the horde. So here you go. Three of those wondrous individuals are gonna go drop in the horde now. That's really bad. Oh, this is getting out of hand quick. We also have to put a spawn here because a new necromancer spawn comes into play and we have to spawn for it right away. So we're gonna grab another spawn and... <laughs> are you serious? What are the chances of all this happening? Okay, so this is a nightmare. This is a literal nightmare now. Um, okay. Talk about a uh, logistics nightmare of trying to keep track of this stuff. Okay, so this one comes in uh, in the same spot as this. Oh my goodness. Okay, so, jeez, this is never ending. Okay, so this guy just entered in as well. Count Temerile. I can't even say his name correctly. This is a regular orc necromancer. Uh, and does say here, all necromancers already on the board gain an extra activation. That's bad. So that means technically this necromancer moves up a space. This guy here says normal necromancer rules plus discard an equipment card from each survivor during the end phase. Deal one damage to count if he escapes. Each survivor must discard an equipment card if available. Okay, so he's really bad. Um, so I'll figure that out in a second because there's too much going on in my brain right now to keep up with this. Um, but we've satisfied this. We'll have to talk with this in a second. Uh, we, do, we brought him into play. He also brings into uh, the game another spawn point, which is just ridiculously insane. Uh, so now we got three of them here. That's a really bad color choice because it looks exactly the same as the other ones. So let's grab a different one. There we go. Well, this is getting a little convoluted. Okay, so now what we're gonna do is we're going to spawn again and we're gonna hope that we don't see anything else nasty. Of course we do. We see a fatty going into the horde and a fatty going on the board. So we'll, uh, let's see here. So this has been satisfied. We'll take those two away. We're gonna put a fatty into the horde, like so. Take a fat fatty, add it to the board. That is craziness. Whew, that was, uh, that was really stressful. That's a lot of stuff going, it doesn't look like much going on there, but like now we've got so many spawns coming, coming around the corner. We gotta kill these guys. And the worst part about it is these necromancers have spawned so far away the only way to actually kill them now is to turn this ballista and start <laughs> shooting through the walls at them, which I can do. And it's probably going to have to happen, because that's the only way I'm going to kill them. Uh, normal necromancer rules. Okay, so let's figure this out in a second. I'm going to leave that for now, because I'm just, I don't understand exactly how that one's going to work. Let's continue with our in-face uh, spawning, so we don't get too lost. We'll start over here with the top one. So here we go for the very top one. And we got nothing. Thank goodness. Oh no, it's an extra activation. But here's the cool thing. So it's an extra activation card. Nobody on the zombie side gets to activate, but this lets Will activate because Will has that cool ability as we talked about called Zombie Link. And whenever that happens, he gets to go ahead. So he can fight right now and I'm definitely gonna do it. So I'm gonna use a short sword and I'm gonna start trying to kill off these walkers that are in here. So he gets a full activation to try this. So here we go, we're gonna try to roll and, uh, and see what we can do. And actually what I'm gonna do really quick is I'm gonna double check to see if he gets all three actions or just one action, but I believe he gets to fully activate again, which is another three, act like his whole action pool. So we'll check that and come right back. Yep, he sure does, he gets to activate, so let's do it, let's roll. He gets three actions, so here we go. First action, rolling against one of the walkers. Not a success, not good. Let's go for the second one. Whew, I almost saw one there. So we did manage to kill off one of the walkers, so we'll go ahead and remove that. And then we're gonna come over here, we're gonna bump him up to a two now, that's good. Now he's got uh, one more, and he can basically go after this guy, because he can't actually hit fatties, he doesn't have a, his bow's not strong enough, it's only one damage. So last action, nailed it. So he cleared out the entire room now of zombies for the next turn, which is fantastic news, good job, Will. I knew there was a reason that we recruited, found you and brought you in. Uh, so that's much better. Um, and again, that extra activation doesn't happen for the zombies because we're in the blue, but we come around over these two that spawn each. So this is just, this is just getting super aggressive. Oh, look at that. I think there is... Uh, now this is so thematic to the Stranger Things um, 
guys so basically in my mind i'm picturing this guy you know coming from the upside down basically like pulling pushing on the walls if you're familiar with the show at all that this is the this is the monster or the abomination that ties right into stranger things so it doesn't come out but it's almost like it's lurking in the shadows wanting to come out it's it's kind of like it knows they're here and then oh no we are so lucky so there's also a dragon so maybe we're hearing a dragon in the distance but nothing is coming into play because we're in blue so that's good because we just burned one of those uh dragon cards which is fantastic uh hopefully we can burn all of them so we don't have to see that dragon uh but that's it and as you can see we actually didn't get any spawning on either of this side but tons over here we've got to deal with these necromancers is getting out of control so now we're going to go ahead and we're going to remove any noise tokens i didn't put a lot on this board this time because we have so many concentrated in here it was obvious uh, so going forward, we'll put some more out if we need to once we start getting out of the mage once we start Not having a million guys sitting in one room making tons of noise with their swords uh, So that's pretty much it now. We're gonna move over to the next round of the game One thing I want to clear up from something that I said earlier on is I said that the ballista can actually shoot through walls and things like that It cannot I read it just a little bit wrong here. It says right here the ballista So this is how it basically firing a ballista works you spend two actions your survivor loads and fires it you firing it is not a combat action, does not benefit from any abilities or game effects. Firing it does not produce noise, that's something to know. The ballista fi uh, fires at every zone in a designated straight line starting from the ballista zone. No line of sight is required, but the shot cannot go through walls or closed doors. So for whatever reason I thought it could, but that doesn't make any thematic sense that an arrow, regardless of its size, could make it through stone walls and come out the other side and hit these guys. So the key point to remember is we got to shoot in a straight line down here. The nasty thing is if we don't get to the to the necromancers early enough, uh, the only option we're going to have is when they come out into the open to this location and then just hoping that the ballista makes uh, lands its shot. If it doesn't, they get out and things become permanent. That gets really bad. So I just wanted to clear that up because I don't want to make it sound like the ballista is like an all-powerful weapon that can literally just blast through walls. Uh, which I did earlier on when I said you could just turn it and fire it. That's not true. Uh, but yeah, going forward, we're going to move into the next round. I'm really excited for this. Things are getting a little chaotic. It's so much fun. All right, so this is going to be super fun and super sketchy. I'm going to try to pull this off. We'll see if it works. We got runners coming down the center. So the biggest thing for that is I'm going to play a little bit of delaying actually dealing with them because I want to get Hopper from this location into the room that we're going to be fighting the fatties with to give them extra dice to help them in their attacks. Um, so I think what I'm going to probably do is get him off that, um, ballista right away. So I think what I'll do is I'll actually go one and then two into the building with these guys and then three. So he's not going to actually end doing any fighting, but he's going to position himself in a spot where, uh, actually, you know what? I'm not going to do that now because first I got to remember that I have some range guys here that can shoot first. So, oh, but that's right. Some of these guys don't use range or sorry, not that they don't use range, but they don't have a two, uh, two damage to be able to deal to actually kill the fatty. So I am gonna to need to, yeah, I'm gonna to need to do exactly what I just did. So one, two, three, to get in the same room with the fatty. The next thing that's gonna happen is Hopper's turn is completely done. The other thing I wanna do is I'm gonna go ahead with Lucas now and activate Lucas. So Lucas wants to search one more time. He's a little greedy, hoping to find something good. Check it out, he got plenty of arrows. That's amazing. That's exactly worth every second he spent in there. Uh, and now he can head out one, two. So now he's on the ballista, which is good because he can be ready to take pot shots at those runners next round and hope to hit them. Otherwise, he's going to have to use his bow for he remember it takes uh, two actions to shoot it and he'll have one more action and his reroll now with plenty of arrows to try and take him out. That's perfect. Um, over here, we want to get uh, 11 can't do anything against him, so we won't activate her yet. Dustin, on the other hand, has the ability to kill this and is the only guy strong enough to do it. Uh, the risk is if I, so I should definitely move in there and try to kill it. If I do, I can search later because he's got a free search action. Or I could just search first. Yeah, what the heck? He's got a free search action. Let's do it while he's in here and see if we get something useful before we move. Uh, a dwarven hammer sounds pretty awesome. That is amazing if I can get this thing to focus. Look at that. That is beautiful and I can use it anytime I want. So it looks like uh, we've got two uh, two weapons that can he can hit fatties with now I'm going to want to trade because I'm going to want to give someone else the ability to do that too that's amazing okay so now he picked that up and he got it for free from his search action Dustin is going to head into this room now and he's going to start swinging with that dwarven hammer which is two dice so 
We'll take two dice, and it's not just two dice, it's three dice, because he's got the Brothers in Arms, plus one die in combat, thanks to Hopper. So there's a real good chance this is going down, although I probably just jinxed it. <sighs> oh, there it is, the five. Wow. Talk about needing all three dice. Okay, so he did kill the fatty off, which is fantastic. So uh, he will be jumping up to two XP. That's great. Uh, so how did he use here for actions? He was here, he did his free search, he did a move, and then he did an attack. So he technically has one more action after this. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to give... Oh, I don't want to give it to Hopper because Hopper has a really cool... He can roll so many dice by dual wielding those. So I don't want to give the... Uh, Norse Sword or the Dwarven Hammer to him. So I might just have to burn this action, which is kind of sad. I've got one extra action. I can't do any more searching. Uh, I could trade, but uh, trading doesn't seem to be worthwhile at this point. No, nah, there's nothing else I can do with him. So I'm going to have to burn that action, sadly. Uh, so now Dustin is done. Lucas is done. Hopper is done. Uh, Z. Z is kind of... Or sorry, I should say Z. 11 would be... It'd be kind of cool for 11 to have... Um, a two damage weapon uh, and, and if she's going to be going up close and personal to people having the healing spell could be really useful maybe giving it to her is a good idea so I'm going to have 11 go, oh this is where it's risky because I'd move her in, trade move and not be able to kill this guy this turn but I could get ready I guess uh, Mike Mike actually I should say yeah he's good, I like him being an archer Mike could potentially, it's really between Levin and Mike as to who should get uh, Dustin's extra uh, weapon. Oh, and you know what? I just remembered, Mike has that Norse shield ability up here, and if he ties that into, I think, the Norse sword, yes, on this card, if he, okay, so maybe I will give the Norse sword to Mike. That makes a lot more sense. So I'm going to activate uh, Mike now. He's going to come in the room. He's going to do a trade, which basically means he's going to steal the sword from him, put it in his hand now. Uh, and then what we're going to do is we're going to do, 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 I got one more action. So what else can I do here? I don't think, oh, I guess I could search. Yeah, searching. Why, why wouldn't I search? Just in case I get something good. Oh, that's not what I wanted. I got myself an orc walker. So I guess if you search too much, you end up finding one. So I did. Uh, that's too bad. So we're going to go ahead here, grab an orc walker. That's tragic. And the good news is, is that at least after I've burned everybody out, I still have um, these two sitting here. Um, shoot, that did not pan out so hot. So now I'm going to go ahead and activate... Um, let's go ahead and activate uh, Will, I think. Yeah, let's have Will activate. He's good. Oh, should I, should I risk searching? That's dangerous. Uh, actually, you know what I'll do? I'll do... Um, 11 has... Uh, she has a melee... Or a ranged attack. That's not good. Um, hmm. Yeah, that's risky. Because if she misses, she can hit somebody in her zone. And that's bad. So I, I should probably have... I should probably have... Uh, not Mike, but uh, Will go in. So Will's going to go in with one. He's got a short sword. Does he have anything else? No. So we're going to go ahead and we're going to roll an attack now for the short sword. Nailed it. Okay, good. He's gone. Thank goodness. Okay, so that's another XP up for Will to four. He's getting there. He's getting higher. And uh, he could search if he wanted to. So I might as well. There's no reason not to. Let's see what I get. Nice. I remember having this in the last game. Uh, Dustin had it. This is a great weapon. Uh, this is much better than the short sword. So this is going to replace that for him. That's fantastic. I could actually give the short sword. Uh, so let me think about this. I was here. Uh, I moved in for one. I attacked. And then, yeah, so I don't have any more actions left to trade. But at some point, I'd like to trade this to Mike. Because I'd like Mike to be able to maybe dual wield if he needs to. Eleven, you're the last person to go. I think going ahead... I think going ahead and probably having... Yeah, I'd say probably going ahead and having her search makes a lot of sense. Ooh, look at that. The magic ball of destiny. What the heck is that? Before rolling any attack, you may roll one die. All sixes are considered as one. Oh, that's terrible. No change to attack roll or all ones are considered as six. That is interesting. That is really weird. I like it, though. I like that 11 has that because that's a really cool, <laughs> interesting item. I've never seen that so far in Zombicide. That's very, 
that seems very, uh, yeah, that's one of those things where it's like you either hold on to that thing or you ditch it. <laughs> I might hold on to it. It seems kind of fun. So we found that, and then we're going to go one space into here. Uh, do I want to trade? Does anybody have anything to give me? Can I take anything? You know what? Having 11 have the short sword may not be bad. So I'm going to trade with, um, with uh, Will here to take the short sword. So now she at least has uh, not only a ranged uh, attack, but also a short sword for fighting up close. So our guys are a little bit more prepared now for what's coming on. So without further ado now, we are now finished all of our characters' movements, and we're gonna move on to the zombie activation. I think it's a great time to talk about this card. Now remember this, guys? We pulled this one out when he actually arrived originally. And if I've got the correct individual, which I think it's this guy right here, yes it is. This is the Count. Now he's really cool, but he's nasty. So this is the thing, it kind of gives you an out. So basically it says normal necromancer rules. This is just something to be aware of. We could have done this in the last end phase, but I didn't want to yet. Because he's not that much of a threat yet, although it is going to cause us an extra spawn, so that's bad. But we have to think about this because now we have enough uh, items and, and, and stuff like that on our characters to potentially think about doing this ability. So the reason I didn't explain this at the time is because it's all about discarding an equipment card from every survivor during an end phase. So during the end phase, when you're cleaning up noise tokens, you're ready to, go, ready to go into the next round, you can choose to ditch one equipment card. If you do, as long as everyone in the party does, you deal a damage to him, you kill him. If he escapes, however, then each survivor must discard an equipment card. So basically it becomes kind of one of those things where it's like, you know, you hope to have a bunch of random junky starter weapons that you can chuck away, and then you do it, uh, you know, in a strategic way, or you could risk it if later on, if he was to come out, in this case, it doesn't matter because he came out very early, but later on, if we were in red and we had tons of great elite weapons, he'd be the kind of one that would be really painful to come out because he'd force you to throw something away and you might really like an item and you don't have something that's garbage to throw away. But in this case, we, we do kind of have some garbage weapons and we've relatively cleared up that whole room and we can search later. So I think going into this end phase, we're going to have to start ditching some of the cards off our characters, even though I, I kind of got them all situated nicely now because we do want to get rid of Necromancers in order to get into this objective file and we don't want this, the extra spawn. It's just not good. So I wanted to let you know that before we move into the zombie activations, which are going to happen during the zombie phase right now. Let's activate some zombies. So the first guy here is going to move to here. We're going to have both of our necromancers moving along the track. We're going to have a fatty going along with this individual. We also have some runners that have run down here. Now technically how this would work is they'd actually move once and you'd fulfill everybody else's and then later you come back and say, oh yeah, they get two. You do that afterwards. But I just do it all at once, that way I don't have to come back. Uh, the fatty's going to move into the room with us. He's the last guy in this entire building before we get that objective. That's fantastic. Uh, the necromancer that's here is already over here. That's really bad. We need to catch him. And then all these fatties are heading this way. So this is where things get interesting because uh, they're basically just still kind of patrolling outside because they have no way to get inside yet. They know there's tons of noise going on here, but they can't get access to anybody yet. Uh, but they'll make their way around and come down through the center and all that good stuff. So we've now activated all of the zombies. We're going to go ahead and do spawning. And as you can see, there's uh, just a few spawns here. Good thing we're still in blue. So this should hopefully clear up some of the nasty abominations that are coming. And I knew there was going to be a bunch coming here. So this is the Siege uh, Breaker. So he's not coming. Uh, now remember, I do have a, a number of each of them. So even though you're seeing these ones not coming into play, it doesn't mean they're not going to come in later. Uh, but we have to spawn three. I just pulled one and that's not coming in. This one is, it's an orc walker and it's going to add to the horde as well. So let's go ahead and do that right now. So we'll go ahead and grab a regular walker like so, and then add one to the horde like so. We'll go for the third spawn in that spot. And oh no, this guy's coming in. This is a cool Kickstarter exclusive character called the Rat King. And it does not matter whether you're in blue or not. This guy comes in. So we are going to have to do a little bit of a talk as to what he does, as well as the rats that he brings into play. This is going to be very, very cool. All right, everyone, hold on to your socks because I got some corrections to make as well as some new information based on this Rat King we just pulled. So first off, 
I did forget the general rule that every single time a necromancer comes in that they activate all the other necromancers regardless of their type. The good thing is I caught this very early on so we can correct this quickly. First off, in the last round, this orc necromancer came up first than this necromancer here. So technically this guy should be one further away now than this guy because he was out before him so that extra activation would have put him there. And of course the only path they have to get to the spawn point to get out they want is all the way through over there. So that's the correct way to go. Coming over here to this necromancer you'll see we've only moved him up one position from the regular walkers that are walking one at a time. We know that we've only given this guy one extra activation. That's incorrect because we have two necromancers sitting here so he should actually be here right now which is really bad. Here's how things get even worse. The other thing is guys, and I didn't realize this, so this is my mistake, the Rat King is actually considered a necromancer and I totally missed this. I thought it was just an additional enemy. So what I had to do is take the remaining deck and I'll tell you guys what I did. I took the remaining deck, I removed one of the regular orc necromancers from the deck because it's just a generic one and made sure there was only, uh, made sure that in total there's only six necromancer cards, of course not counting the ones we already have out anyway. Uh, but this is a necromancer and that threw me for a complete loop But I wanted to correct all of that then I just shuffled everything back and threw it in the pile So we're good Nothing changes that way. It just might be a little confusing for you guys But essentially this is another necromancer and I didn't even know and it's crazy cool because you could actually just have the rat king And there's a whole mechanism for his swarm coming into the game So for instance, he has six cards and if you chose that you wanted to put them all in and get all the other necromancers out of the deck they ha it has this really cool ability where every time one of these cards comes out, more rats get pull in put into play and they behave differently and all this good stuff. Uh, but because we have such a nice widespread different pile of necromancers, there isn't that uh, six of them in there. First off, there's only one. Um, but anyway, long story short, we got him when we were in blue, so we only get one swarm, so I guess that's good for us. But he is a necromancer, so when he comes into play, just like all the other ones, all the other necromancers get to go again, which means the orc moves one, this guy moves one, and this guy moves one so just like that these guys are booking it towards that entrance this is really bad the swarm of course comes in at the same spot as this necromancer and as we already know another spawn point follows in the exact same position so now we literally have four spawn points here which is absolute madness and we have to go ahead and resolve another spawn and one last thing about that Rat King that makes him really cool is again, if any more Necromancers come out on the board at any point in time, they all obviously all give the Necromancers that are already on, in play another activation. With the Rat King, the crazy thing is he basically gets another Rat Swarm, so based on whichever danger level he is in, they, more rats come into his into his current position, so he just starts like spawning rats off of him like crazy. So that's kind of how he's used. So he doesn't necessarily have to have all six, as I just mentioned, in the deck to use his cool abilities. He can be mixed in with everybody else because whenever a necromancer gets pulled, all the other necromancers get an extra activation. And that extra activation is essentially what, uh, um, you know, he uses those swarms or he'll gain more and more uh, rats to his pile, basically. So... Uh, one more thing that I thought I should mention because I was going to jump to the next spawn here But I want to mention this is that the swarm of rats are actually considered uh, a damage one minimum damage destroy one Experience point one and they just have some special rules here So basically they don't activate right now, but when they do activate um, And stuff like that they're going to move really quickly So we'll talk more about that when they actually activate there's no point in doing that right now But uh, we will have to figure that out very very soon and so to not clutter up the playthrough with any more rules rules will just continue on so we're going to move to the spawning for this brand new spawn point that we just added in and cross our fingers that there's no more necromancers coming out because it's getting out of control we got ourselves a zombie giant so again because thankfully we're in blue nothing happens thank goodness okay so that's a freebie there now we're going to move up to the very top location right there and see what we get up top what do we have Another Assemble the Horde, it's one walker, so this is one of the lighter ones, thank goodness, and one to the Horde. So we'll grab some walkers, we're going to put one in here, and we're going to put one up here, nice and easy. Coming over here, we've got two spawns to resolve, so let's go ahead and pull those. So we're going to get a Assemble the Horde, two walkers and one, so two and a one. So we'll put that one in the discard, and we're going to grab two and a one. So we'll put one inside of here, that Horde is looking mighty scary. And then we've got one more spawn here to do. So let's find out what's behind that one. Nothing in sight, thank goodness. Okay, 
Whew, we need to get rid of some of these spawns. So obviously uh, the, the trebuchet is going to become one of our major objectives right now because we need to not only be thinning that crazy horde over there to the left, but we need to start hitting and be able to hit people because once we're on that trebuchet, we can hit anybody. And these necromancers are just one HP to kill. And we're going to be able to rip through this pile so fast because we have literally four necromancers on the board already. So we have every necromancer we need to literally check this entire pile. And, and that's madness. So now that we've gone ahead and spawned everything, we don't have to deal with noise tokens because I didn't bother putting any down because it's fairly obvious we're having a ton of noise in this room right here. Ah uh, yes, and seeing as we're in the end phase, it'd be really silly of me not to throw away a card for every survivor to get rid of one of the necromancers. So let's do that right now before we end it off here. So I'm gonna go ahead, I'm gonna have the lightning bolt be discarded. Now this is actually kind of sad because I like this one, but I like the bow combination better for him. This has better range, but overall, I prefer the bow combination with the reroll. Um, and I also have a plus one max range anyway, so I think I'm fine. So this is the one that uh, um, Lucas is going to discard. Uh, for Z here, we have to decide, or 11, I've decided which one I want to turf. I really like this magic ball. It seems so, so cool and unique. I just don't know if it's going to be worth it. Healing is definitely worth it. Um, the short sword, on the other hand... Oh, uh, the short sword's a basic item. You know what? I might turf that one. I might turf that one, I think. I don't really need... I can search for something better. So the short sword gone for her. Sadly here for him, he's going to have to get rid of one of his short swords so he's no longer going to be dual wielding, but maybe I can, uh, you know, trade it over from, from somebody else. So I'm going to actually get rid of the starter version, even though it doesn't really matter too much. Coming over to him, uh, this is where it really sucks because now if I, oh, I have to get rid of my short sword because I need this to kill fatties. So I guess all the short swords are going away. <laughs> so I guess dual wielding, that's never going to happen for him. Uh, longbow versus, oh, this is a tough decision. Do I kill off the longbow? Which allows me to shoot super long range, uh, only one die though, and have a reroll. Or do I keep this this zombie killing weapon? This is a really good weapon. I think I'm going to let this go, and I'll keep the plenty of arrows and hope that I can find a better another bow later on. Uh, coming over here to Dustin, Dustin only has two options, so I'm going to probably ditch the plenty of arrows uh, because that's the one that just makes the most sense. He's not even using it, so there we go. All six items discarded, which is enough to blast away this particular count. So this count has now been killed off. That's fantastic. So he is right here. Boom, gone. No longer in play anymore. And we, because we killed him off, we get to take a look at one of the objective markers. And it's a green one. Are you serious? We got super lucky there. So we actually got a green objective, which means now we are just looking for the blue one. So we're gonna be able to get into this room. That's awesome. Uh, we still have so many necromancers on the board to go through, and we have no idea where the blue one could be. It could be here, here, uh, or up there, or up there, or it could be one of these three over here. Regardless, that was totally worth doing. And the other thing we don't want to forget about is we get to remove any spawn point we want now. And this is where a strategy comes in, guys, and I'd like you to get your opinion on this, guys. What spawn should we remove? Out of these, should we take it from this area right? Should we take the spawn basically that came in as a result of him? Should we take a spawn from this side of the board? What should we do? What's our best strategy? Let me know in the comments below and at the beginning of the next video, we'll remove that spawn of your choice. But that is going to wrap it up. And uh, we're going to move on to the next round. But we're going to wait. We're going to pause. It's going to be the end of the video. We're going to come back in the next video and continue on through our playthrough. So hopefully you guys have been enjoying this at this particular point in time. If you have any questions, let me know in the comments below. Thank you so much for your support. This has been a blast so far. I'm already terrified. I don't even know if I can pull this off. If you have any strategic uh, thoughts on how do you think we can stop this necromancer up here, we do have the ballista. We're going to have to get somebody on it. We do have Hopper here. Or I shouldn't say Hopper. That's Lucas. Uh, to potentially use uh, to shoot him. We could also put Lucas in a position like here to shoot ranged at him. That might not be a bad idea either. We might need to bring someone back to do the... So maybe having someone come back now to uh, sit on the siege weapon wouldn't be bad because it's one, two, three. And then have Lucas maybe position himself here. Of course, he has to deal with these guys first. But it could work. And then we've got oh, so many necromancers making their way around uh, at some point. So that's going to be, it's going to be exciting. And it's either going to end in absolute uh, death for me. Uh, because what's going to happen is if the necromancers start getting out, all of these crazy necromancer spawns flip over and become permanent. And then spawning just becomes a bloody nightmare. If I get into yellow, I have abominations popping up like crazy. 
and at that point we're gonna get overrun. So we definitely need to kill these necromancers. So I'll take any help and any advice you guys want, so throw them in the comments below. Thank you so much for watching, and as always, keep on rolling solo. <laughs>